All right, we're at 11.45, and I know the Hazard Center is proud of its reputation for staying on time, so we are going to begin. Welcome everyone to this session of exciting research reports from four promising uh, young professionals in disaster research. My name is Jack Mazeris. I'm the Science and Technology Advisor for Natural Hazards, Disasters, and Resilience at the National Science Foundation. And I am going to minimize my air time because we have just an hour and I want to maximize time for our speakers. And also we are going to try to make time for questions. So please, um, you know the drill, put your questions into the chat so that we can follow those. And as time allows, we're going to, we're going to turn to the questions and have some interaction. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker who is Anais Roque. Uh, Ana East has broad research interests in food, energy, and water insecurity, as well as in multi-level strategies like household, community, and state strategies for disaster resilience. As a graduate researcher at Arizona State University, she was a project leader in culture, health, and the environment library, uh, laboratory, working with students from diverse fields on qualitative data management and analysis. And, Ana Issa's work has focused on community resilience and water insecurity in the wake of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. And before uh, attending ASU, she worked as a shelter administrator in the wake of that hurricane in Puerto Rico, which sparked her interest in disaster response and recovery. So Ana East, please um, move ahead. Thanks, Jack. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Can everybody see that? Awesome. Thank you everyone for taking from your time to join us in this conversation. Um, the title of my presentation is Coping with Water Insecurity, Water Sharing as a Disaster Response after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. As many of you may know, in 2017, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico and the archipelago was devastated. Um, roads were blocked, water and power services were out, and broadly, this was a humanitarian crisis. This experience um, incited my passion to study how human societies can plan for and respond to complex disasters. And today, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about my research in that area. To give a bit of context on the intersection of water challenges, Puerto Rico and the disaster, Puerto Rico is an incorporated territory of the United States since 1988, um, since 1898, that is known for its colonial state. For water services, the Puerto Rico Aqueduct and Sewer Authority, also known as PRASA, is the government owned and monopoly corporation responsible for water quality, management and supply of 97% of households in Puerto Rico. In the past, um, PRASA has been a system that has fa faced high leakages, has also had problems with financial capital and overall um, inequate maintenance. PRASA has also violated federal health standards as outlined in the Clean Water Act. During the 2017 hurricane um, season, when Hurricane Irma hit Puerto Rico in in September, 13% of the residents were without water services. And then in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, which happened 14, around 14 days after Hurricane Irma, 92% of households were left without water services. By being more than a thousand miles away from US mainland, colonial policies such as the 1917 Jones Act limited Puerto Ricans to obtain aid from other countries. And this, along with governmental challenges, delayed for federal government aid, residents really knew that they had to rely on each other to address the cascading challenges that came from this event, such as water insecurity. My research applies a disaster's perspective to social network analysis for water sharing. But briefly, disasters can create various um, serious problems in terms of water. For example, dams can break or water sources may be cut off, like in the case of Puerto Rico. Interestingly, over the last five to eight years, anthropologists who specialize in the study of water insecurity, reciprocity, and informal economies have started to intensively study water sharing as a survival strategy in extreme water insecure conditions. 
depths. Water sharing is defined as these transfers of water that occur um, amongst households that are designed to meet daily needs, such as drinking, cooking, sanitation, washing clothes, and so forth. And recent research on water sharing has shown how it's very crucial as a coping mechanism or a survival strategy in water insecure communities. These transfers can be viewed as gifts with or without expectation of reciprocity. And as most research of water insecurity has focused at the household level and in communities in the global north and global south, um, water sharing had not been studied in the context of disasters. And here is where this research fills a gap by bridging water sharing practices and disaster responses. Based on the literature and my personal experiences after Hurricane Maria, as part of this project, I asked two main empirical questions. First was, was water sharing widely used as a disaster response to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico across urban, peri-urban, and rural areas? And what were the factors that shaped water sharing arrangements in households? To investigate when, why, and how water sharing occur in the wake of this crisis, I utilize an open-ended structure protocol with an egocentric or personal network elicitation. Um, the survey questions in this protocol broadly contain questions about water situation prior to Hurricane Maria, during, and then two years after this event, as I conducted this research in summer of 2019. And um, as part of the sampling strategy, participants were purposely selected for their water because of their water insecurity situation after Hurricane Maria. And the sample size set was set at 24 participants per site, as is based on empirical evidence for minimal sample sizes in qualitative research. The three sites are um, Rincon is a peri-urban coastal community, Maya West is a urban center community, and Añasco is a rural community municipality. As part of the data analysis, I conducted egocentric network analysis, and I also conducted a thematic analysis, which I'll describe further. As part of the network analysis, I wanted to understand the type of um, how egos had strongest ties, so the type of relationships that the participants had to receive water after this event. And results show that for um, the majority of the, of the participants received water mainly from king or family relationships. And this was approximately 50% of the participants. This was followed by multiplex ties, meaning that these people that gave participants water were either family and neighbor as well, or family and friends, right? There were multiple types of relationships with the participants. Then this was followed by neighbors with 14% of participants and friends with 9% of participants and then coworkers with 4% of participants. These results were consistent with the literature on disaster response that shows how people rely mainly on their family in the wake of a disaster. I also asked, um, I also did conducted uh, statistical analysis to understand if there were differences across the network sizes, across the sites, but these were not statistically significant. As part of the thematic analysis that I conducted, three major themes help answer my question of what factors enabled inter-household water sharing, and these are generalized reciprocity, personal networks, and labor cooperation. Interestingly, and Unfortunately, when I asked participants how much time it took them daily to get water, they expressed that it took them between 30 minutes but up to three hours to get clean and safe water. As most participants discussed, they really had not engaged in water sharing planning outside of their household or prior the hurricane. So in this sense, these water sharing practices were mostly done spontaneously. These gifts and exchanges were also done greatly without expecting anything in return, as um, this ethnographic exemplar from Angela explains, but I won't be able to read due to the time constraints. These transactions were done altruistic on the line of assistance, and if possible and necessarily, uh, assistance was returned. And that is the definition of generalized reciprocity. During this event, 87% um, of the participants interviewed said that they engage in generalized reciprocity with at least one person from their network. And those that didn't engage in reciprocity addressed that they were in a worse position than the person that actually gave them water and could now re reciprocate. To address being water insecure, participants talked also about the value of their personal networks. 
with Pedro's example and with other participants, networks were really valuable because they assisted in decision making for water, such as coordination to get water, but also information to where and when find water. Personal networks were also important for those that had disabilities, elderly people that couldn't do the long lines for water in different places like municipal tap um, locations. And also it was important for women as they were addressing other challenges in the household, especially they were head of households. In this context, personal networks were recalled as valuable and extremely beneficial to cope with the simultaneous challenges that people face. So for example, also with transportation challenges that didn't allow them to go long distances to get water. Lastly, across the each sites, um, as participants were engaging in giving and seeking water, labor cooperation, meaning helping each other out to achieve a common goal, was a common theme. Cooperation took different forms from logistics to go to the rivers and get water, to division of tasks to collect water from different sources, and even visiting uh, munis different municipal tap waters to, to get water. Additionally, participants also address how they created plans with neighbors or friends to give water to other communities outside of their location that they knew from mouth to mouth that needed water and that local and federal um, responses were not reaching to these communities. This and other narratives um, to labor cooperation were really rooted in solidarity and wanting to support others in most vulnerable situations. In this sense, um, my work makes um, three important contributions to the study of disaster response and water sharing. To begin, this is the first um, water sharing study undertaken in a disaster setting utilizing a network approach. It shows that as in other water insecure settings, water sharing is a widespread disaster survival strategy. Second, this work shows three key factors that enable water sharing as a disaster response. So these are the norms of generalized reciprocity, existing social networks, and forms of labor cooperation. These findings are important because they suggest a possible agenda for future research on water sharing in disaster contexts globally, considering extreme weather events impacting utilities like it was in the case of the Texas freeze a couple months ago or with the wildfires in California. Moreover, this has important implications for emergency managers and decision makers in the area of disaster preparedness as a focus on networks can be used in applied settings to reduce vulnerability and allow people to have the human right of water in the wake of a crisis. This can be done, for example, through community events that can allow neighbors to connect with each other or also on brochures that can assist families to plan for water storages in the hurricane season. However, I do want to clarify that this cannot be misinterpreted as a strategy for the continued neg negligence from governmental institutions. So it is imperative that decision makers work to address the critical infrastructure failures and disaster risk reduction strategies. As this event really harms people and that really are already suffering from other political situations such as neoliberalism, colonialism, and even poverty. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Anis. I don't see any questions quite yet. Um, I was personally wondering, with the kind of work that you you just described, what was the what was the most important challenge in trying to get the research done well? Um, I will say it it was really about trying to make people remember that event because these interviews were taken two years after Hurricane Maria occurred. So a lot of people, you know, didn't want to dive too much because it brought memories, right? So it's really about managing the ethical considerations when talking about how um, being water insecure affect them, right? And I have other, you know, it also affected people's mental health being uh, with extreme worries and also physical health with you know carrying water from long distances to doing longer lines right so all these intersections so bringing back those those stories was was a challenge both for them and also for me because i i lived it the event and and i was also aiding communities in in the process so yeah 
So let's see, we have a question. Um, could you talk about the interplay of the norms? For example, if someone had social networks and shared labor that determined who they would share water with? Yes, so um, people were, at least the participants were mainly sharing within families even though like families across different sites. So for example, people that lived in Rincon but had family in Añasco or in Maya West, they will first go to them. But if their neighbors needed help or if other people needed help, they will also um, assist them in, in that process. But everybody also was trying, or at least most of the participants were trying to maintain it mainly between their families and, and kinship ties because they knew that everybody else was trying to survive and trying to find resources for their own people, right? So in that sense, um, the family members were the, the main um, networks addressed. All right. Other panelists, is there anything that you'd like to ask before we move on to our next speaker? Are we good? Uh, here we go. So we have another question. Did anyone mention how they would change or maintain water sharing in the future? Lessons learned mentioned in the interviews that may hint at them being more resilient in the future. Yes, so unfortunately, um, I asked people if they had made water sharing plans for the future and um, most of the participants had not made this plan. So this people answered that they didn't because of different things. So I conducted this in July and August and hurricanes hit in Puerto Rico in September. So people were like, well, we're not that close to a hurricane season yet or we have not thought about this yet or we are still waiting to see if this is gonna be like a big, hurricane season or they knew now because based on the previous experience where would they get water so they didn't have to engage um, in sharing experiences but it is other the other people that the other participants that did plan which were lesser but they did mention that the hurricane did show them the importance of their networks and that they were helping other um, people also think about networks within household but also across the households. So it's like it needs further research to really understand the dynamics for future resiliency and how this network can be purposely um, moved. Terrific. Thank you, Anise. Uh, so our next speaker is Chandler Wilkins, who is from Texas A&M. Chandler's a PhD student studying urban and regional sciences. He has a bachelor's degree in community and regional planning from Iowa State and a master of urban planning from Texas A&M. He currently studies disaster mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery of public housing authorities. And he is interested in discovering potential gaps in the support offered and developing methods to fill these sorts of needs. Chandler is also the current uh, Bill Anderson Fellow, and he serves as coordinator of the Collaborative Communities Initiative. So Chandler. Great. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for that introduction. Um, Jack, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. All right. There we go. All right. So again, good morning, everyone. Um, as Jack said, my name is Chandler Ian Wilkins. I'm a PhD student studying urban and regional sciences at Texas A&M University. And today I'm going to speak with you all about the beginning stages of a project that I'm working on. Um, the larger project will focus on the mitigation pre preparation response recovery efforts of public housing authorities for their residents and the resident needs and priorities and perceptions. But for today, for a small scope that I have, <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanted to start this project by first understanding the natural hazard risk of communities with public housing developments. And for the purposes of or the purpose of today's study, I'm going to go ahead and focus on Houston, Texas. So with that, I'm going to jump right into what we're going to go over today. So today I'm going to discuss the motivating factors for this research, the research question that I have uh, for this particular section of the research. 
Uh, the National Risk Index, which is a tool that I use, um, their variables, Houston's hazard priorities, the results from my analysis, and then some future steps that I have for this project. So getting right into it. So here are a few news articles I've read over the last few years that focus on Houston being impacted by natural disasters. They talk about Hurricane Harvey, flooding, extreme heat, and one of the most recent disasters, Winter Storm uh, Yuri. A few of these articles also discuss preparation and how Houston was and is not prepared to handle these natural disasters. And because my research agenda focuses a lot on public housing authorities and their residents, after reading all these articles and a few others, I started to wonder how public housing authorities prepare themselves as an organization and their residents for natural hazards and disasters, especially public housing authorities that are continually impacted by uh, natural hazards and disasters. Uh, so one of the first things I wanted to do for this topic was to compare the natural hazard risk of communities. And for the sake of this presentation, I ended up using census tracts um, with public housing developments to see if there's any difference between the two. So this leads me to my research question. Um, so the research question that really drove this presentation was, uh, how do natural hazard risk factors and census tracts with public housing developments compare to those without public housing developments? I originally wanted to use block group level data, but the tool that I use to, to identify natural hazard risks, which was the National Risk Index, only has county and census tract level, level data so far. So that's what I went with for this particular study. So I retrieved the census tract level data, like I said, for 18 natural hazard risks from the National Risk Index. And for those of you that may not be familiar with that, um, it's essentially a comprehensive nationwide risk assessment that was created by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, so FEMA. Um, then I also retrieved public housing development data from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and HUD, cleaned it all and combined the two data sets uh, and stated and then performed statistical tests to see if there's any actual difference between public housing developments and those uh, uh, since attract with public housing developments and those without. So now we'll go into those variables from the National Risk Index. And here they have 18, um, an individual risk or individual hazard risk index score uh, was measured with the relative natural hazard risk of a location for that single hazard, essentially. Uh, for every score, there's also a qualitative rating that describes the nature of the community score in comparison to all other communities. So they scored, um, well, the range was from very low to relatively low, relatively moderate, relatively high, then very high. And so since I wanted this study to really focus in on Houston, um, I went and found Houston's Office of Emergency Management. And luckily, they had already outlined some of the city's natural hazard priorities or things that are already on their radar. So I trimmed down the uh, variables to focus on the ones that were uh, already on their radar. Um, now, I also added three extra variables to this list, all from the National Risk Index. Um, you see at the top there, social vulnerability, community resilience, and expected annual loss. These three were used to calculate overall risk for census tracts, and I wanted to view them all separately to see if there's actually any real difference between them. So once we get to the actual results, um, if you look at the variables with an asterisk on it, uh, those were the ones for the difference between census tracts with and without public housing developments were statistically significant. And so we'll go ahead and start with social vulnerability and work our way uh, diagonally. So just to give like a more context of what this variable is and what it measured. Uh, so social vulnerability for the sake of the National Risk Index was defined as the susceptibility of social groups to adverse impacts of natural hazards, including disproportionate death, injury, loss, or disruption of livelihood. Um, this variable considers the social, economic, demographic, and housing characteristics of a community that influences the ability to prepare for, respond to, cope with, recover from, and adapt to environmental hazards. So as we can see, census tracts with public housing developments were more likely to be socially vulnerable, 
Um, social vulnerability for census tracts with public housing development is actually ranked relatively high, which is the second highest on their uh, their rating score, um, as compared to those without that came in at relatively moderate. And then when we look at hurricane and winter weather, we see census tracts with public housing developments were more likely to be at risk of hurricanes and winter weather. Uh, and then we look at community resilience. So community resilience was defined by FEMA as the ability uh, of a community to prepare for and anticipated natural hazards, adapt to changing conditions, and withstand and recover rapidly from those disruptions. And so this variable was not statistically significant, like the difference between the two was mainly because both um, census tracts with public housing developments and those without all rated relatively low. So across the board, community resilience in Houston was seen as already pretty low. So overall, these notations provide a high level snapshot of the risks uh, census tracts with public housing developments face in comparison to those without. And in my opinion, knowing the risk differences and the risk overall aid as we begin the conversation regarding uh, risk reduction. And for me, when I was just starting out, this kind of created a baseline knowledge of those risk factors and areas as we begin the research and uh, planning process. So this was you know, a brief introduction to the work that I've been doing so far. And some of the next steps that I have for this project specifically, I wanna perform this analysis with block group level data if I can find it and get it. Um, I also wanna speak with public housing residents about their experiences. So I feel like a lot of times this is often lost uh, when we do analysis like these and risk assessments. So I wanna understand their experiences, the perceptions to uh, risk of natural disasters and their immediate needs and priorities uh, in the immediate aftermath and throughout the disaster hazard processes. So I want to get all those, but I also then want to speak to the Houston Housing Authority about their perception of natural hazard risks and how they actually prepare their residents and try to compare and see where we have there and see if there's anything, any through lines there. And then if possible, I'd like to expand this research to other cities um, after I get all things done here. So overall, this is what I've done so far, and this is what I have. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Thank you. I can see why you're excited to try to get a more detailed level of information. I know actually that one of your professors, Walt Peacock, has been working with the census department on uh, new tools that will be available in controlled settings with some more detailed information. So I hope you'll uh, lean on Walt to chat with you a bit, but maybe there's someone else in our audience who knows of data sources uh, that might be useful. So I invite that kind of uh, contribution into the chat as well. Um, you are getting some questions here. So how do you think the results for Houston would compare with other cities? And are there particular cities, I'll add on to that, are there particular cities that you think would be of interest? So uh, for particular cities, I've been looking at Beaumont and Lake Charles to begin with. I've done a lot of, uh, looked into their demographics and tried to see like, are they comparable to Houston? And for the most part, they are. Um, how I think Houston will compare to them, obviously Houston is a, a larger city, uh, probably with more resources um, and everything. But I think overall, they're going to be pretty similar with what we see with the, um, with the comparison between public house census tracts or whatever with public housing developments or without, I think it's probably going to be pretty similar across the board. So you have a question from Alex Abdon Nabi, who is from an organization called Capital Metro. And Alex wants to know what do you see as steps local emergency managers could take to assist residents in public housing to increase their resilience? Um, 
So one of the first things I would say is actually going out and uh, speaking to them. So I, I did an internship at the Houston Housing Authority a few years ago when I was in my master's program. And um, usually, you know, phones for interns don't usually ring. So when my phone actually rang one day, I was pretty excited and I answered it uh, immediately. And so um, uh, it was one of the residents that we had and they were talking to me about, they were trying to find somebody and they found me. Um, so they, were, they just want to talk about like what they were going through, their experiences and what they actually needed. Um, at the time, you know, as an intern, I really didn't have any power. So I brought it up to my supervisor and everything. Um, we try to get things handled that way. But I think actually going into the community, asking what their needs are and what their priorities are would be one of those first steps because people know generally like what they need. Uh, we just have to think, get out there and ask them and see what it is and then get them what they need when they need it. For sure. Good. Alex says thank you. All right, uh, let's move on to our next speaker. And that is Phil Gilbertson, who's also at Arizona State University. Phil's doctoral research focuses on the intersection of hazard mitigation and climate change adaptation planning in the United States, with particular attention to state level land use planning. Phil has a bachelor's in meteorology, and he has served as a commissioned officer in the Air Force and remains active in the reserves. And he has led teams focused on meteorology, special ops, intelligence, and geospatial information and services. Phil looks forward to completing his doctoral degree and re-entering professional practice, focusing on the nexus of risk reduction, community planning, and public policy. So Phil, please take it away. Hi, uh, thank you. Yeah, first I'd like to thank the workshop and Jack for the opportunity to present this research today. Um, and then also to my fellow pa panelists for presenting their exciting research. The project I'm discussing is funded by the National Science Foundation Intern Program and explores the effects of California Senate Bill 379 on planning decisions and practice at the local level. The project is a partnership between Arizona State University and the FEMA Region 9 Hazard Mitigation Planning Branch. As this is an ongoing project, I'd like to first introduce the project, explain why we chose to explore this topic, and then present some of the prelim preliminary observations we've made. <clears throat> Given the audience for this workshop, I'm sure some of these planning frameworks are familiar, but it's important to note that all of those listed here have been used to address hazards and reduce vulnerability in local communities in one form or another. With changing climatic conditions, persistent vulnerabilities, and more extreme weather events, Local jurisdictions have begun to incorporate novel planning frameworks to more holistically address risk and, and limit future impacts. These new plans include sustainability, climate adaptation and resilience plans, in addition to the traditional, general or comprehensive plans found in most communities. However, despite growing attention, the adoption of these, of these novel but voluntary approaches has been slow and challenged by a myriad of factors. While recent scholarship has focused on voluntary standalone plans, some suggest that these novel approaches are more likely to succeed when integrated or mainstream with existing planning practice. Others suggest that adoption of voluntary plans is unlikely to occur, especially in resource constrained communities, unless regulation, regulatory requirements are modified. Pragmatically, this raises several questions. Are these new types of plans leading to better risk reduction outcomes? Do more plans lead to greater action? Are well-established planning frameworks no longer viable under future conditions? And is it time to update planning requirements to meet emerging challenges? These are some of the questions that motivate this research. In 2015, California took a bold step and became the first state to enact a statewide planning mandate requiring local communities to address climate change adaptation in their communities' plans. Although Oregon and Hawaii incorporate climate change adaptation considerations in elements of their local comprehensive plans, California is the first and only state to mandate such actions. State planning requirements play an important role in addressing the shared governance dilemma of risk reduction. Whereas disasters are experienced locally, the majority of resources to recover and adequately mitigate future disasters reside at higher levels of government. Yet decisions as to where and how to manage land use are most often determined at the local level. These local planning decisions have a direct impact on the vulnerabilities and risk experienced by community members. 
Therefore, state planning requirements, which often mandate local land use planning policies and practices, bear special attention when addressing risk reduction at the local level. So what does California Senate Bill 379 actually require in local plans? Under SB 379, local jurisdictions are required to update the safety element of their general plan to include a, a climate vulnerability assessment, adaptation or resilience goals and strategies, and a plan to implement um, those various aspects um, of their goals and strategies. Local communities are given discretion as to whether to incorporate these requirements directly into their safety element or via reference to another standalone plan, such as a hazard mitigation or climate adaptation plan. Those with a local hazard mitigation plan must comply upon their next update of their hazard mitigation plan, whereas those without such a plan must comply by 2022. There are several notable features of this mandate. First, the mandate provides discretion as to which type of plan local jurisdictions may select. Second, this is an unfunded mandate. Although the state of California provides guidance in the form of the California Adaptation Planning Guide, as well as resources, tools, and data to inform local decisions, there are no direct funds set aside for local planning activities. And third, it's unclear whether the state is tracking the compliance of local plans. As a cooperative policy, SB 379 relies upon the willing participation of local governments to meet the mandate's intent. That said, there are incentives for local governments to pursue certain types of plans, such as hazard mitigation plans, over other more voluntary types. Although local jurisdictions have discretion to use a variety of planning frameworks, two stand out. For nearly two decades, local hazard mitigation plans have been used to address uh, hazard risk in communities across the US. Although hazard mitigation plans are voluntary at the local level, they do grant access to certain pre-disaster federal funding opportunities. Today, over 23,000 local jurisdictions and 239 tribal nations have adopted hazard mitigation plans, covering roughly 84% of the US population. Climate adaptation plans share notable similarities with hazard mitigation plans, but tend to solely focus on climate-related hazards. These voluntary plans are a more recent phenomenon, with an, with an only estimated 40 to 100 communities across the US adopting a fully developed climate adaptation plan. Although there has been an explosion in the development of adaptation-related guidance, tools, and data sets in recent years, there remains no standard planning process or authoritative guidance to inform local practitioners. Given the notable similarities and seemingly surmountable differences between hazard mitigation and climate change adaptation plans, there remain questions as to whether uh, there is untapped synergies in combining these two approaches. So as the first state to enact a climate change adaptation planning requirement, California offers a natural policy experiment through which to explore the various planning frameworks local jurisdictions may utilize to address future risk and reduce vulnerabilities related to a cl changing climate. In this context, we ask the following questions. How has plan quality and the selection of mitigation and adaptation strategies changed since the implementation of SB 379? And second, why are local jurisdictions selecting one planning framework over another? To answer these questions, our study first explores the content of local plans, analyzing plans from the same community, both before and after the passage of SB 379. This content analysis includes over 110 criteria measuring climate adaptation plan quality. Additionally, we look at the various categories of adaptation strategies selected in each of these plans. Our goal is to understand the changes that have occurred in planning practice since the passage of SB 379. We pair our content analysis with practitioner interviews to understand the reasons, motivations, and perceptions behind some of the planning choices. As of today, we've analyzed 24 plans, representing half of our sample jurisdictions. And we hope to begin practitioner interviews with by the end of the summer. Although we're still in the midst of data collection, I can offer a few preliminary observations thus far that may, may generate points for discussion. One, of the 29 jurisdictions included in our sample, most have chosen to utilize local hazard mitigation plans as the primary planning document to meet the requirements of SB 379. This is perhaps unsurprising given the prevalence of hazard mitigation plans across the US, their ability to readily integrate climate change considerations, and the emphasis of, of plan integration within the California Adaptation Planning Guide. Perhaps more surprising is limited use of alternative approaches such as standalone climate adaptation and resilience plans. Second, most continue to address future uncertainty following the traditional predict and plan approach. Despite the uncertainty of future conditions, 
we have yet to observe any plans that utilize alternative approaches to managing uncertainty, such as the use of multiple scenarios, adaptive management, flexible or adaptive pathways, or the selection of robust strategies that produce positive outcomes regardless of future conditions. And three, finally, and most promising, is that plan quality with regards to climate change considerations does appear to have improved. This preliminary finding holds true both in jurisdictions with no prior plans addressing climate change, as it does with those front runners, um, now on their second or third generation of climate plans and strategies. At this stage of our project, it's difficult to infer too much from these observations, but it does suggest that SB 379 has made an impact on local planning practice. And we look forward to analyzing our planned content analysis with practitioner interviews to understand those motivations uh, that they took in, in creating those plans. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it there and see if there's any questions. Uh, but again, I'd like to thank the workshop for the in invitation to present here today and to, um, to Jack for moderating the panel. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Phil. Um, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the NSF intern program, this is a sort of supplement opportunity that is available to, uh, pro to PIs with active awards. And we create opportunities for your students to go into uh, for-profit companies or not-for-profits, or in Phil's case, I, I think you're the first one I saw that went into a government agency, but uh, we're very excited about creating these opportunities for you all to get to know other sorts of organizations much better as it informs your research so well and also creates opportunities for other career paths for you. So um, really been really happy to see that Phil and his advisor are taking advantage of that new opportunity. While we wait for typed questions to come through, Phil, I wanted to ask you an informal question. And that is, uh, is your impression in working with these communities that they welcome the incentives and the opportunities to do this sort of planning? Uh, or do they see it as a burden? Is there anything we should be thinking about in terms of making it uh, you know, more palatable to them? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and in fact, it's actually one of the motivations for coming back to uh, pursue a doctorate. Um, so separate, I, we haven't yet to, to conduct any interviews with local practitioners, however, prior experience, anecdotal experience that I've had with uh, local practitioners is that some of this needs to be much, much more digestible. Um, standalone plans are great. They serve a wonderful purpose. They've, they've motivated action. They've moved um, practice in, in, in a positive direction. Um, but I think there needs to be an alternative approach for those jurisdictions that just lack that capacity to do so. Um, you know, often the cities that get, get heralded uh, for, for a lot of their work our front runner large cities with high capacity that can, that can bring on consultants and, and even have you know, depth in their planning departments or, or other uh, departments to, to carry out say resilience or climate adaptation uh, planning. Um, and I think what, what's interesting about this research uh, is that we're looking at uh, hazard mitigation plans, which you know, there are notable differences between those and other, other frameworks out there but they do create kind of a ready, ready-made vehicle that can easily incorporate climate change considerations um, if prompted under the right circumstances. And so I'm really curious to see when we start doing these interviews, whether there's a difference between uh, smaller jurisdictions, rural jurisdictions that don't have the same capacity as some of those larger cities and, and uh, metropolitan areas um, that seem to get a lot of the attention when it comes to climate change adaptation. Um, so I, I don't have a, an, an easy answer for that question. Um, but it really is one of the reasons for, for coming back to pursue this and why I kind of jumped on this opportunity to work with FEMA on this, because um, there, there are possibly some ways to change um, guidance in the future to, to help out uh, those cities that just lack that capacity. Yeah. yeah, I see that. I see this thread of working with groups that are extra vulnerable um, through all of the work that you guys are talking about today. And I'm so pleased to see that this is, this is a part of, an important part of disaster research in this moment. All right, so no one has uh, weighed in with a typed question just now. So we'll go ahead to Zach and maybe we'll have uh, the opportunity to take other uh, 
overarching questions at the end of the session. So uh, Zach Cox at the University of Delaware is a PhD candidate in the Disaster Science and Management Program, where he works as a research assistant. He holds a bachelor's in sociology from Mount Royal University in Calgary, Canada, and a master's in disaster and emergency management from Royal Roads University in Victoria, Canada. Um, Zach is an experienced disaster practitioner who has worked as a recovery management consultant with IBM, as a research assistant with Mount Royal's Center for Community Disaster Research, and has volunteered with the Red Cross. Cox's interests in business continuity, disaster recovery, and community resilience are being applied to understand how small organizations update their internal processes and engage with communities in new ways as they navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. So Zach, please take it away. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, uh, everybody. Um, my name is Zach uh, and I go to the University of Delaware. And I wanna talk about uh, my dissertation research, business continuity as entrepreneurship. Before we jump into things here, I wanna take a second to thank my committee, uh, Trisha Wachendorf, James Kendra, Jennifer Trevetti, and Lisa Richard. They've helped me develop this idea from something that I actually developed, uh, the germ started germinating here at the Natural Hazards Workshop in 2019 into something that's really high quality and, and I think impactful. So on tap for today, I wanna to start things off by talking about what business continuity is entrepreneurship for small organizations navigating COVID-19 means. We're gonna start off by reflecting on doing research during the COVID-19 pandemic, frame the problem, and then get into the theoretical framework uh, of business continuity, intrapreneurship, and entrepreneurship. So when people think about doing disaster research, Maybe they think about that, um, that classic image of Corin Telly and Anderson getting off the plane in Anchorage, Alaska uh, with their big voice recorder to go and um, see, the, see the, the, the damage and talk to people. Or maybe they think about Samantha Penta and uh, Daryl Yoder or Bontrager there in 2015 in Nepal on the ground, physically surveying the damage. Of course, that was impossible with the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this is a shot of, of my home office, right? Just like everybody else, we had to, uh, we had to, to change things up. And there's been a, a, a you know, that, that changes how you do research, right? What we've ended up doing is uh, 35 round, uh, individual interviews over the course of 2020 and 18 interviews uh, in 2021 with small organizations, that's uh, both businesses, small businesses and small nonprofits um, across Delaware, for the most part, and, and around the United States. We're very inclusive in this. Um, research or participants came from many industries, all sizes, and a variety of incomes. Of course, you know, compared to doing disaster research in other ways, um, there was a little bit of novelty in this, right? It was a little bit harder to recruit participants. It was a uh, very hard to build rapport with people over a, a camera. At the same time, there were some advantages in terms of uh, each interview being easy to record and that kind of giving a vividness to every conversation. One of the things that really struck me though, doing research on COVID from my home, in my community, talking to people who might be my neighbors, is the closeness of, of the problem. Um, it's easy to look at the statistic and, and see uh, how bad things are, but I wanna point you here in the direction of, of a gal named Carrie's Activity Center. Uh, it was a place where you could go and do STEM experiments. I talked to Carrie once in 20, uh, 2020 and once in 2021. And I just want to direct your attention. This is her, her uh, workspace. Look at the beauty um, of this table, right? She put so much care, so much time, so much attention, so much money into her small business. And when it shut down, it's not just a statistic. It's a place where community members used to go, where her, she used to go, where her managers used to go, where her employees used to go. And it was a place that she thought she was building her future. And unfortunately it's gone now. So this project started with the idea of trying to bring business continuity to a small organization like Carrie's in order to protect it. So business continuity traditionally looks a lot like those stacks of paper in the background there. Jack mentioned I used to work for IBM and at IBM, I would make a business continuity plan. 
and I would test that business continuity plan. And then I would come back with the client and I would revise the business continuity plan. It's a very expensive, very time consuming process that simply small organizations don't have the time or money for. The example I'll share on this is of Tracy who inherited a liquor store from her late father. Uh, but before he died, her father was very sick. And so the liquor store fell into a state of disrepair. And by the time she inherited it, she had so many tasks to do so much work that business continuity, business continuity or preparedness for a pandemic uh, specifically was just out of the question. So she couldn't do it. I don't want to say, though, that small organizations didn't have any capacity or didn't have any care for disaster. A lot of times, the people I talked to mentioned having previous experience with disaster that made them more uh, willing to see or more able to, to act. The example I'll share there is of Catherine, who does communications work. And when Catherine was in her 20s, as an undergraduate student, she went to Rwanda after the genocide. And she had initially signed up to do uh, some English teaching, and she ended up going there to bury bodies. And that experience has had a huge effect on her, right? It's not a pandemic, it's not a disaster as we might, or a natural hazard as we might traditionally define it, but it changed how she interacted with people. She reported being more kind, and she reported having a little bit more sense of danger. So when the pandemic, when she could see the pandemic coming, she was primed to take a little bit of protective, protective action, right? To make sure that her and her team were taken care of. And so business continuity in that sense is uh, all about experimentation. Trying new things, applying capacities, you know, having a little bit of money to do this was really important. Having spent time in the community was really important. Having that network, having peers you could bounce ideas off. And having technical savvy really seems to have enabled a quick transition that, uh, that was needed. Just imagine how useful it would have been to know how to use Zoom at a high level or work from home at a high level in, uh, in February 2020, you would have had a huge advantage over your peers. And so once small organizations pivoted to working from home or uh, working in new ways, I don't wanna say that they, they protected themselves completely. The pandemic is still raging and, and there is uh, no, no sure fire protection. But once they started finding those new ways of working, they engaged in intrapreneurship. That is uh, updating their policies, processes, and procedures, their internal facing stuff to do new, do new ways of working. And, and that started with a vision plan, reflecting on the purpose of the organization. And the example I'll share here is of Jackie, who has an organization that helps elderly people age with dignity, age in place, and live engaged lives. So pre-pandemic, the way that they did that was they took people out to appointments or they helped them garden or, or that kind of thing. Post pandemic or during the pandemic, they spent time with uh, letter writing campaigns or phone calls or that kind of thing. The goal being to keep elderly people engaged, but finding new ways to do that. One of the things that has helped small organizations to do new types of work are the loans, grants, and aid that have come about through things like the Paycheck Protection Program loans or economic disaster assistance loans. And these have been really important. I talked to a gal named Sasha who uh, owns a restaurant and she had lost 72% of her sales year over year in April, 2020. So she, she was 72% bringing in 72% less money in 2020 than she was in 2019. Just imagine what it's like to look at your bank account and know that you can't support the infrastructure that you have, the staff that you have, the everything you have on your bank account. And so although the process of getting a, a paycheck protection program loan or an economic disaster assistance loan was very difficult, it helped people stay afloat and innovate. Um, it allowed them to work from home or shift to working from home. It allowed them to invest in their employees, upskilling them. It allowed them to redefine their relationships with their landlords, other organizations, and the government. And this leads to entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is that external adaptation, coming up with the new products and services that allow you to, or a small organization, to engage with its uh, community in new ways. And the example I'll share here is of Brian, who, when I spoke to him in 2020, was in a, a bad way, right? He had a conflict management consultancy. Most of his clients were hospitals, and he had found that most of the, the clients that he previously had were too busy to even take his call, understandably. He was looking 
same as Sasha, at a bank account that was rapidly diminishing. But because of loans, grants, and aid, when I spoke to him again in 2021, he was much more optimistic. He had pivoted. He had taken his core conflict management capacity, and instead of doing hands-on consulting, he had developed an app that aligned with his state's K-12 teaching teacher training curriculum, and he was just about to deploy it. I don't know quite how that went. Um, I'm looking forward to following up with him maybe informally in 2021. Um, but it, it's an example of using that that those loans, grants, and aid to come up with a new product that aligns with the vision statement and the purpose of the organization. As far as next steps go, you know, we talked the, the business continuity panel talked about how difficult things like the uh, paycheck protection program loan was to get. And absolutely, it was really difficult. It, uh, it required a relationship with the bank. It required a lot of navigating legalese. But for those who got it, they were able to do really interesting things. And so I argue that maybe for future hazards, one of the things that we need to look at is applying these programs to supplement existing ones. Because as they've been applied in COVID, they, they work fairly well. So with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Jack. Any uh, comments, questions, or concerns, if you want to talk about them here, would be great. Or feel free to email me at cox at udell.edu. Thank you. I'm going to have to go on Twitter and see what disaster Zach looks like. I, you know, I, that, I couldn't, Zach was taken, so I had to come up with something. Good. So um, I'm going to invite the panelists to open up um, your microphones at this point. Um, as questions roll in, I'll be sure that we pay attention to them, but we do have just a moment here to reflect on what you are observing across all of the research that you've just shared with each other, um, things that you've been inspired to consider as a result or questions that you have for each other. I was just, I, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in. I was really impressed with this panel on the focus on uh, helping people, right? Doing things that are, you know, Chandler, even you, you were worried about getting the phone call and helping that person out. It's, it's an interesting direction for disaster research in that the goal isn't generalized understanding, but really specific things that can help people in their daily lives. I can echo on what Zach just said. Um, I wanted to ask all the panelists, how do you see your research moving forward, thinking about cascading or compounding disasters, meaning that, you know, as climate change keeps impacting communities and, and systems, critical infrastructures keep being weakened and the politics intersect, how do you see your research supporting communities in, in that context of multiple ongoing um, events. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in for, for one second. That's a great question, Anais. Um, yeah, I, I think one, we're living in a time where we're seeing cascading effects right now. I mean, we have multiple disasters at the same time and then depending on where you live, um, it could be you know both the pandemic plus, plus physical, um, you know, hazards that, that communities are experiencing. So I think actually, you know, looking at, at my research, kind of focusing on, on how communities plan for this stuff, um, I do think it raises some questions about kind of the technocratic approach to some of these, um, you know, plans. Um, hazard mitigation plans, and I've reviewed dozens, if, if not more than that, um, at this point, um, you know, they continue to look at hazards almost in isolation. There's very few that look at the uh, cascading effects and, and maybe the closest you get is, is looking at drought and say a power outage or something of that nature, um, mostly like in California. So I, I do think that that moving forward, you know, some of these other voluntary planning uh, approaches such as resilience plans offer maybe a, a different lens through which to view hazards, which is maybe a little bit more promising than, than just looking at hazards in isolation. So, so I do think that's, that's something to consider moving forward. And I, I think it's kind of promising to see a lot of those um, aspects being implemented in, in some of these more novel novel plans. 
Then I'll just chime in really quick because I know we're about to end with time, but a lot of my work now pushes towards uh, trying to get public housing authorities to create disaster plans. Um, and HUD has done, uh, I think, a great job of providing like a toolkit of how to do that, uh, but not every public housing authority has the capacity to do such a thing. And so really for me, tr I'm trying to think of how best can we support public housing authorities as they're trying to support uh, their residents. So we have multiple disasters. They need to have some type of plan in place of what they're going to do. And so they will know what to do and then the residents know what to do, so. Um, yeah, so we, we are at time. I just want to add in that uh, I, I echo Anias, um point here that uh, I think compared to years ago, hearing people talk about our disaster research, the idea that at some level, the resilience of the people at the end of the chain is, is really what matters. And we're beginning to give ourselves the freedom to think all the way through that life cycle. Um, and I think as a disaster research community, that will make us more helpful in the end, which is what we all want. So it was my privilege to get to know you. Um, and so uh, Aeneas has offered her email address to you all in the chat, to everyone who's attending, if you'd like to get in touch with her later. And of course, you can Google any of us and find us if uh, you'd like to follow on. But Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I really appreciated this opportunity and I enjoyed learning about all of your great work. Keep it up. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.